Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is uh, Sakika Fukuda Par. I'm professor of international affairs uh, at the New School in New York City, where I am also director of the Julian J. Studley programs in uh, international affairs. Um, it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome you to this first in a series of webinars that um, we are hosting at the New School in collaboration with Health Policy Watch, um, a Geneva-based independent news service um, on the topic of global pandemics in an unequal world. Um, we will be having monthly webinars moving forward uh, and you will uh, find announcements on them on our website. And I'll give you more details about that before the end of the um, of this webinar, which will, we will proceed for one and a half hours. Um, our, um, um, as, um, as this pandemic unfolds, it is one thing is very clear um, that um, uh, its unprecedented reach and um, is uh, uh, un reinforcing inequality. Uh, not only are low income and marginalized populations more exposed to risks, um, but, but the pandemic itself is likely to, in fact, further deepen inequalities within and between countries. Um, and in fact, I think it exposes how the, 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 the limitations of the institutions of 21st century capitalism um, uh, and how they're um, ill-equipped to protect the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the public in, and promote public um, health interests. Um, our webinar series will ask, seek to ask what are the public policies, civil society action, social movements, norms, and dis discourses that we need, local, national, and global, to combat inequalities and promote a more egalitarian and sustainable pandemic response. Um, before we get started with today's um, panel, um, I want to just take the, this opportunity to thank the people who are involved in planning today's event. Um, of course, I start with uh, thanking Elaine Fletcher, the um, editor of Global Health um, uh, of Policy, um, sorry, <laughs> Health Policy Watch. But I also want to thank my colleagues um, uh, at the New School who um, worked on. Um, uh, um, on um, promoting this event, on setting up, uh, Matthew Turner, Lorraine um, <clears throat> uh, Passion, Amina Majid, Candice um, Jaimungal. Um, so on a logistical note, um, if you have a question for the panelists, please uh, feel um, uh, welcome to pose it via the chat box in the top right-hand corner of your screen. When posing a question, please list your name and location from which you're joining us and we'll endeavor to get to as many questions as possible at the end of our program. Um, so let us start. Uh, the speakers here need no introduction as they are all leading, uh, leading international work in analysis, advocacy, negotiations, um, and, um, uh, and policy for greater health equity. Uh, we're very privileged to have with us Winnie Bianima. Um, she is the executive director of UNAIDS. Um, she started her career as a champion of marginalized communities and women as a member of parliament in uh, the National Assembly of Uganda. And from that time, she has occupied many uh, positions in uh, national and international um, organizations, including with the African Union and uh, UN Development Program, and most recently as executive director of Oxfam International. Um, what I think is most people don't know is that um, she started her career actually with a training in aeronautical engineering. <laughs> uh, Mandeep Daliwal, um, can you wave your hand? <laughs> uh, Mandeep um, 
is Director of HIV Health and Development at the UN Development Program. Uh, she has been uh, leading uh, global health policy, particularly for expanding treatment in low income and low and middle income countries. Um, she's led many innovative initiatives, including the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, the Secretary General's High Level Panel on Access to Medicines and Innovation. Um, she's also had a very long and diverse experience in global health policy. Um, working in Zambia, India, elsewhere in Africa, Asia, Latin America. I don't know that there's anywhere where she hasn't worked. Um, Nicoletta Dentico is a journalist. Uh, can you wave your hand? <laughs> and director of uh, Global Health for Society and International Development. Uh, she too has um, been a long-standing advocate for health uh, equity and in development. She worked for um, the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, campaign on access to essential medicines. Uh, she's also uh, worked with uh, the World Health Organization. Um, Marjorie Mahajan um, um, is uh, my colleague on the faculty of the, um, the New School uh, Graduate Programs in International Affairs. She's, where she's also the star professor and co-director of uh, the India-China Institute. Um, she is a social um, scientist who, has, um, who focuses her research on um, uh, global health, um, and she's worked for, um, on, on a number of specific um, issues such as uh, HIV AIDS in India and South Africa, um, and I think she will be um, bringing us um, perspectives um, of a social scientist who studies uh, how pandemics affect society, drawing on anthropology, development studies, and uh, science and technology studies. James Parrott is, um, uh, is uh, also my colleague at the New School. He's Director of Economic and Fiscal Policy at the Center for New York City Affairs um, at the New School. Um, he has... Uh, 30 years of experience in uh, analyzing New York City uh, economic and fiscal issues, uh, working with cities and state governments, as well as the private sector. Uh, he was most recently the deputy director and chief economist of the Fiscal Policy Institute. Um, and um, so um, we are going to proceed um, as a uh, in the format of a moderated conversation. Uh, we will not have um, prepared um, statements, but we hope we'll have uh, kind of an open um, uh, exchange of views. Um, each person here is speaking in their independent capacity and not representing uh, any organization that they work for. Um, but what we see from this um, wonderful group of uh, speakers that we have is that we have people who have worked in many different parts of the world uh, in, um, in, in different uh, kinds of organizations from, you know, national parliaments to think tanks to uh, universities to, to journalism to other civil society organizations. So I want to start by asking um, about what is going on in different parts of the world. And um, so I'd like to turn to um, Nicoletta, um, who has been, who is I think speaking from Rome and she has been um, experiencing the pandemic. The pandemic. From, um, from um, uh, uh, Epicenters. Um, so, um, Nicoletta, uh, from your um, from where you are sitting, um, what has been your experience? One of the uh, BBC news um, uh, channels started um, an, uh, um, an episode um, uh, last week by stating that COVID is not a social leveler. Uh, what does that, how have you experienced that in Italy? Uh, yes, uh, um, good, good, good morning and good afternoon or good evening to everybody. 
uh, yeah, uh, in fact, it is not a social leveler. I mean, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, always uh, thought that uh, and the epidemics like uh, wars uh, would be equalizers, but uh, uh, we have seen in Italy, we have clearly seen uh, the the poisonous combination uh, of uh, two, the, the two viral strains of two pandemics, the virus, the new coronavirus, and the structural pandemic of inequality. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 has really, you know, exasperated a series of issues which the country already harbored since a long time. And by the way, Italy in its kind of small, uh, Booth represents pretty much the inequalities that the world uh, displays usually between, uh, you know, you have a very vibrant and uh, productive and rich north and the south, which is not poor in itself. I mean, it would be very rich, but it's usually been historically been exploited by the north and therefore lives a situation of, uh, um, uh, you know, is kind of left behind. Uh, uh, people are migrating to the north, uh, people are leaving, and uh, uh, the economy is not so, so vibrant. And moreover, there's a, another very important fact that I think we need to bear in mind is that uh, Italy has, uh, uh, you know, several regions of the south which are systematically controlled by organized crime, which is another terrible, you know, pernicious virus <laughs> that is there. And this, of course, uh, like in Mexico today, you have the drug cartels that are managing the, the, the virus or the economic impact, the socioeconomic impact of the virus. Uh, uh, this is also happening in, in Italy. We are now uh, in a very um, delicate, in the midst of a very delicate and very thorny, very complex transition between the first phase which has been uh, the surprising uh, uh, exercise of a national lockdown uh, that has going on has been going on now for two months, basically almost, and uh, um, which has surprisingly seen uh, the Italian population perhaps uh, more uh, capable of uh, respecting the rule of the game than people would have thought. Uh, we are kind of surprised how people complied with the lockdown. Uh, of course, uh, almost two months of lockdown, uh, a country which is in a, in a sort of a pharmacological coma like this, like we are still, is, is, represents a, a problem in terms of uh, mental health, in terms of uh, impacting on, on existing inequalities. And now that we are trying to move away from this first phase where the whole country was behind uh, in a way the policymakers to the second phase where we are uh, already uh, existing with a legacy of uh, frictions um, a lot of controversies and a lot of desperation because we lost uh, 27,000 people in two months I mean which is something totally unheard of I, I know this is a uh, this is something that has, is happening and has happened every, elsewhere. I mean, this is what is happening today in the US, what is happening in other European countries. But there are many uh, questions that are uh, now will, you know, will have to be um, better understood. And also they will have to be uh, scrutinized legally. Who has been responsible for so many deaths and who has been responsible for not complying with what uh, uh, the WHO was saying and the government was also saying. So we are moving uh, away from this uh, kind of pride of being Italians and all following this lockdown and still keeping it up to a phase of, uh, uh, I think, uh, a, a bit of a mental breakdown. <laughs> the country is going through a very difficult, uh, a very difficult moment. Um, the, the, the disease has hit the North more than it then it has hit the south, certainly. Uh, this is something that, uh, from a health perspective, is kind of uh, surprising. It has also shown very clearly that despite the fact that Italy was supposed to have, is supposed to have, one of the most advanced 
health, uh, health systems, national health systems, one of the most advanced uh, welfare state, well, the decades of uh, uh, social spending uh, cuts uh, and uh, the, the very serious problems that we've had uh, with austerity measures uh, since the financial crisis have uh, devastated completely the health system. And this has produced a lot of, uh, uh, of the inefficiencies, of the dysfunctionalities. I think one of the most, uh, uh, the most difficult issues has been the question that re regions are in charge of health. So we have a national health system, but it is the regions that are in charge of, uh, uh, of, of their people at the regional level. And this health, uh, health devolution, health fragmentation is no good recipe when you have to resolve uh, problems uh, at, uh, at, such a, at, at this uh, unprecedented level. So um, there is a disparity already. If, if we go by regions, there is a disparity of, already in between those regions that are wealthy enough to, you know, uh, structure themselves uh, with uh, somehow a system, a health system, and those that cannot. Um, and generally what I can say is that uh, what we are learning out of this uh, um, shock, this, uh, the, the shock wave of COVID-19, is that uh, we will have to really revise, reconsider, and uh, um, we will not be alone in this, I guess, <laughs> the privatization of health, the fact that uh, over the last few decades we have uh, commodified, privatized and financialized the universal human rights and health has certainly been an experimental ground. So uh, the disease has hit the most where health was most uh, uh, systematically in the hands of the private sector and where the system was totally fragmented in a kind of unregulated coexistence of public hospital and private hospitals. Of course, uh, private hospitals have, uh, have kind of vaguely been engaged in facing this disease, in facing the emergency, and uh, this has been quite problematic, uh, but the fragmentation, the very structural fragmentation has created a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of delays, a lot of uh, um, problems that finally resulted in losses of lives. Uh, the main, and, and I will stop here for the moment because we could you know, discuss for, for too long, but certainly uh, what I would like to sort of uh, draw two major, I think, inequalities that we have seen north and south, as I said already, but even within the north, between uh, the uh, elderly people that are completely, you know, uh, they have been uh, uh, either abandoned in this kind of hospital, in this kind of homes uh, uh, where there has been a devastation because uh, uh, once the hospitals could not absorb uh, the, the affected people anymore, People were actually sent to these uh, homes, uh, elderly people homes, um, and, and this was a major problem, a <laughs> major, major devastation. So how the issue of the elderly people have been affected. Eh? And I think also we have another problem on the completely either, uh, other side at the moment, which is, uh, I think, uh, the mental health of young people, of the very young people, of the children that have been completely locked down for two months now, uh, completely separated from schools. I mean, uh, for what school is really, it's not just uh, tuitions, it's a social venue where you really socialize. And in Italy, schools will not reopen until September. So this means that all those very important existential passages of closing the year, having your exams, and you know all these very important uh, moments will not simply be there. And this, I think, will, will have a long-term effect on the young generations, who, by the way, have lost their uh, grandmothers and grandfathers without even say goodbye, which I think is an intergenerational shock that we will have to coexist with. I'll stop here. I mean, just a few brushes. Thank you very much. But I think um, that gives us a very interesting sort of overview of what is happening. But I think some of the things that you emphasized about 
how um, the most uh, worst the, the worst hit areas are also areas <clears throat> with a different kind of uh, health system, the fragmentation of the health system, the privatization of, of health systems actually raises these questions. I think this is something that we are seeing in New York City. So I don't, not want to now turn to you, James, uh, to talk about how you see uh, the, the, the key elements of inequality in New York City and how that is also related to the kinds of health systems that, that we have here in New York City. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's nice to be here, um, even though the topic is uh, one that's fraught with, uh, with a lot of fears and unknowns. Um, in New York City, uh, the pandemic has played out, um, not to be unexpected, in, in, in very polarizing ways, uh, both in terms of the economy and, and in terms of uh, what the health effects have been. Let me first start by talking about the economic effects. Um, unlike in, in many countries, because of the thoroughgoing nature of the lockdown, uh, a lot of economic activity has come to a halt. The response of the federal government has not been to assure employers that they should keep their workers uh, fully on the payroll uh, so that when the public health crisis eases, they can return to work. The response takes the form in the United States of laying workers off so they become unemployed, they're economically dis displaced. And this location um, has uh, proceeded to an unprecedented degree at this point, and we're now dealing with a situation of unemployment far greater than what we experienced after the Great Recession of 2008, 2009 in New York City in the wake of the World Trade Center attacks in 2001. Um, and you would have to go back to the Great Depression in the 1930s to uh, see uh, the extent of economic dislocation that we're experiencing right now. I think it's useful to think in terms of the workforce in three categories. First, there's the essential workers, the frontline healthcare workers, uh, plus all of those workers involved in provisioning providing food uh, to sustain you know, all populations. Um, then there are the public service workers, uh, transit workers, uh, childcare workers, and so on, that are taking care of uh, making sure that the essential workers are able to get to work, taking care of their children, and so on. So that's the first category. The second category, which has been uh, heavily impacted by the dislocations, is what I refer to as the face-to-face -face service industry. So, uh, this prominently includes uh, restaurants, most of retailing except for food stores, um, a lot of construction, local transportation services, neighborhood services, barbershops, nail salons, and so on. Um, and it also includes the, uh, the art sector, which is very prominent in, in New York City, uh, has a lot to do with the cultural um, and and uh, the uh, the attractiveness of New York City, the art sector has been put uh, you know completely on hold uh, for the duration of this. The third category of workers is what I refer to as remote workers, and these are workers who tend to be uh, much better paid, who are who are uh, able to retain their jobs. Many of them are able to work remotely, whether it's in the finance sector or uh, management or professional services, uh, some parts of higher education, uh, teaching remotely and so on. So this category of workers uh, still has their salaries, still have their benefits, have health insurance. You know, in the United States, health insurance is most often provided through employers. So when people lose employment, they lose access to health insurance. So we have these three categories of workers, essential workers, face-to-face -face workers, and remote workers. The brunt of the economic impact has fallen on the face-to-face -face workers. These are largely lower paid workers, many persons of color, over half of them are immigrants in New York, a lot of undocumented immigrants. So these workers, and you know, we estimate that um, 
it, uh, it affects several hundred thousand, a million plus workers in New York City. Uh, roughly 25% uh, of all private sector workers have, been, have lost their jobs and many lost their health insurance as a result of this. So very concentrated uh, economic displacement effect uh, with uh, sort of a patchwork of economic assistance being provided by the federal government, uh, very unevenly felt. Undocumented workers are totally frozen out of uh, any access to those benefits and are forced then to continue to search for work, putting themselves at great uh, personal health risk uh, and so on. On the health impact side, um, New York City, I guess, has the unfortunate distinction of being the epicenter of the pandemic uh, worldwide. Uh, we've had um, out of uh, 50,000 plus deaths related to COVID-19 in the United States. A third of those, or around 17,000, have been in New York City, heavily concentrated in the lowest income neighborhoods and communities in New York City. Um, communities that are very dense, uh, where le uh, people tend to live in uh, very crowded housing conditions and so on. Uh, various factors that have, have elevated the risk, uh, the, the health risk that uh, individuals endure. Our healthcare system uh, reflects the broader pattern of inequality in New York City. Um, we basically have a private hospital system and a public hospital system. The private hospital system is organized in large networks um, that have uh, effectively adapted to the changing healthcare reimbursement system over the years in the United States and uh, have comfortable uh, balance sheets and uh, positive revenues, even though they're ostensibly nonprofit organizations. The public health uh, uh, public hospital system, on the other hand, uh, is chronically under-resourced. There are a, a small number of private hospitals, safety net hospitals in these poor communities. So the hospitalization impact of this pandemic has been very concentrated in the poorest neighborhoods in these hospitals that are under-resourced uh, relative to the, other, to the others. Um, this situation continues. Uh, we're still under you know, uh, strict uh, social distancing uh, mandates uh, in New York City. Uh, a lot of people out of work without health insurance. Um, there's pressure nationally to return to work. There's a lot of apprehension about that because uh, frontline workers, healthcare workers don't have the necessary personal protective equipment. Uh, we don't have uh, effective procedures in place on how the broader economy can restart and people can return to work without unduly exposing themselves to public health risk. Well, I, that's, I think these are really very um, interesting points that I think this, these realities um, show you how unequal societies actually lead to unequal health consequences, right? And uh, both through the ways in which people can access healthcare and the ways in which the way that people work and live uh, actually lead them to be more, more vulnerable. Um, at the more um, global uh, uh, context. Uh, could I turn to you, um, Winnie, to say something, tell us more about how you see this uh, in other parts of the world, particularly in Africa, um, where you are, have been working, but also where you're, you're uh, from, um, and also how um, some of the, um, the problems require international action. <clears throat> Uh, can you unmute yourself, please, Winnie? <laughs> Thank you very much, Sakiko, and I'm delighted to be on this panel with these distinguished people. Uh, epidemics such as this one or any other, by their very nature, feed off inequalities that are existing and make them worse but by their very nature. And that's what we see COVID doing to inequalities between countries 
and within countries. I'll give you two examples, one from Africa and one from Asia. From, let me start with the Asian one. You know the clothes we wear, Sakiko, for, we buy from Gap, from H&M, from Zara. It's a global supply chain. They're global supply chains. They own, the shareholders, the CEOs sit somewhere in Europe and America. The CEOs earn millions of dollars. And at the bottom of the supply chain are Asian women actually stitching these clothes in factories. I know one of them, a woman called Fatima, for example. She works 80 hours a week. She's not given sick leave. If she got pregnant, she'd be fired. She doesn't meet her targets. She gets abused. That is the life of, and she earns, I think she, she earns close to an, a dollar an hour. That is her pay. Now, COVID comes. And of course, at the top of the chain is a CEO who would four days work. He earns as much as what Fatima would earn in her entire lifetime. That's the inequality there. Come coronavirus, Fatima and her friends have all been laid off. They go home with nothing. And a public safety issue is now a food crisis for them because they have no food to buy for their children. Meanwhile, the CEO and his millions sitting in Barcelona or wherever is still paid and he still has still got his job. That is how, and, and you could take it to now, how does Fatima cope? How is the lockdown treating her? How is, are the lockdown measures working for her? Can she still find something to eat? I won't go there, but just to give you the disparity that the crisis hits, some have a cushion, some don't. Some already, who are already weak are weakened further. Come to Africa. African countries have been struggling and have made some choices, some of which are good, some not so good. They've borrowed a lot of money in the last 15 years to spend on physical infrastructure, to open the economy, their economies so that they can be part of the global economy. But they've been divesting from the social sectors. So much so that when the debt came to quite, uh, uh, close to distress levels, they started withdrawing actually completely in big time from the health sector. The extent that 30 African countries are today paying more towards debt repayments than to their health sector, investing more in the debt repayment than the health sector. That's the situation African countries have found themselves in. Corona hits at a time when they have very, very little fiscal space to address a new epidemic or even to address the health needs of their people. How have they managed with health? They've passed the cost of healthcare to ordinary poor people by imposing user fees. More than half of the Sub-Saharan African countries have some form of user fees that people have to pay to go to the clinic. These user fees are not small. They sometimes can amount to almost 80% of their entire health spending. So they are a big chunk of, their, of what they spend on health. And the result is that now we are in a corona situation. Who is going to go to a clinic when they've got a fever if they've got to pay a cost and they have no money in their pocket? So we have a situation where we have user fees that are themselves now an obstacle to prevention because people won't offer themselves to be tested. We have a situation where debt has been waived by the G20, debt repayments have been deferred, but not cancelled. It's a good start, but it's not enough because they just have a little space now in six months to spend a little more. But that's only the bilateral governments. They've also got private debt, which ha we haven't even heard from the private debtors. We haven't even heard from the multilateral banks, the World Bank, the regional development banks. They too need to take action. They haven't yet. So African countries are in a problem. Coming to 
the lockdowns for prevention, they have been quick. Our leaders have really acted quickly to prevent, knowing that once it gets in community, it's hard to control and they haven't got the money. But the lockdown measures are so, uh, they, how can I, so extreme, they are not gendered. They don't take into account the particular needs of poor people. We are seeing people being crushed, being made to choose between public safety and going out to look for food for the day for children. Water, water is the burden of women. An African woman walks on average six kilometers to fetch water. Now you're telling her to give people water to wash 10 times a day. How can she do that? So we have the people who are most vulnerable having the least cushion to save themselves from an epidemic. This is what I mean by worsening inequalities. They are already at the bottom because of, of uh, the, uh, the age of inequality in which we are in. Now Corona comes and makes them more vulnerable and with less cushion to protect themselves. I could go on and tell you more about the gendered impacts and so on, but I know that there are others with other perspectives to bring in. But in summary, we need to get the user fees lifted for people to be protected. We need more debt and even debt cancellation. We need to be sure that when a vaccine comes, it is there for all people, not only the rich, but it's available for all. We have issues of inequality that must be addressed if all of us are to be safe. Thank you. I, I think what you're, you just said highlights the fact that the social and economic institutions that we have put in place that are existing are actually shaping these unequal consequences, right? I mean, the, the vulnerabilities of the workers that you mentioned, whether they are working in garment factories in, in Asia at the bottom of the supply chain, um, or uh, households in Africa where the women have to go and fetch water. I mean, these that the burdens that, that, that people feel are actually accentuated by, uh, by, by COVID. And it's also the manner of the response, the lockdown itself, in particular has these uh, unequal consequences. Um, and, and I think that just uh, leads us to realize that the, the response has to be far reaching, that, that the, in order to uh, combat uh, the unequal consequences of, uh, of COVID, we needed, first of all, equitable policies and social institutions in place uh, but also further design responses to be more equitable. So I want to turn to, um, to you, uh, Mandeep, to see how you, um, your perspective on these, these policy responses to, um, uh, to, to make sure that the, um, the, 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 the post-COVID world, you know, is not one that is even more inequitable. <clears throat> thank you so much, Sakiko, and thank you, colleagues who, on the panel, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I think, you know, one thing, um, you know, all the panelists have really highlighted very, very well the, the dual relationship between COVID and inequalities, that it exposes them, it exacerbates them, and it is a result of, of some inequalities as well. Um, the one point I would like to add to all of this is that we're not just dealing with one crisis here. Winnie mentioned two, I think. She mentioned the crisis of inequality, the crisis of COVID-19, but it also comes crashing into the climate crisis. And I think we're dealing with multiple crises, so the policy solutions need to address multiple crises, but not in the way we've done them in the past, where we make trade-offs where we trade off a health benefit for an economic benefit, or we trade off an economic benefit for an environmental sustainability benefit. So there can be no more trade-offs. We need solutions that actually address the drivers and the consequences of these three profound crises coming together. 
And I think COVID illustrates that in a, in a, in a very powerful way. Um, the UN released its framework yesterday on the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID-19. And there's a very powerful quote in there from the Secretary General, which says, let's not forget that this is a human crisis. We must fundamentally focus on people and the most vulnerable. And just, you know, Winnie, you were talking so eloquently about the challenges in Africa from like the structural policy angle down to the human level, um, you know, of an informal worker and the impact on her. Last week, infections rose by 43% in Africa in one week, COVID infections went up by 43%. I mean, it's staggering. Um, on top of that, you have cases popping up now in fragile settings like Yemen. Um, and I imagine in refugee camps, uh, where, these, where these solutions that we're seeing to COVID right now of shelter in place um, and wash your hands um, and social distancing or physical distancing are meaningless in many ways. What do we do there? So I think solutions need to really be adaptable to the most vulnerable, and they need to take into account the local context, especially the most fragile context where there is no ability to protect yourself. Um, and the late Jonathan Mann used to talk about HIV and human rights. And he used to say, he says, you know, imagine a tree that has no leaves in a forest fire. And then a tree that is, that it has a lot of leaves and is full and lush. And that is the situation of human rights and how the most vulnerable who don't have a right to quality basic services, health, education, social protection, social safety nets, who don't have adequate standards of living, living conditions, who don't have access to medicines, who don't have access to vaccines, who don't have access to food, who don't have access to water, how can they possibly protect themselves from the highly infectious, globally distributed um, situation that we're seeing um, presented by COVID-19. So our policy solutions at the very core have to have the most vulnerable person in mind. They have to be designed around that. Um, and this is not impossible. We know from, this is not our first pandemic, many of us who are on this call. The HIV pandemic showed us that actually global solidarity led by the people who are most vulnerable and most affected can drive incredible positive change and policy solutions. So I think we need integrated solutions. We need to really, really deal with some of the systemic structural inequalities that have gotten us to a situation where we're dealing with three huge crises at the same time, inequality, climate, and COVID-19. And the solutions need to address all three in a way that puts the most vulnerable um, at the heart of the solution and in the driver's seat for the solution, making sure that we um, are actually talking about um, access to basic services, about social protection, about you know, dignity of life, about jobs, green jobs. Um, that's the way that we will rebuild uh, and build back better, which is starting to become part of the narrative now. Um, without doing these things simultaneously and in a way where there are no more trade-offs that leave the poor poorer and leave the vulnerable more vulnerable, there is no way out of this. Thank you. Thank you. In many respects, I think some of these principles are also reflected in the basic uh, tenets of the UN 2030 agenda, you know, leave no one behind, integrate Absolutely. environmental, uh, social, yeah. economic, uh, all governance dimensions. Um, uh, Mandeep, you were saying something? And no, I, I was just going to say that actually, you're absolutely right, Sakiko. I think the Agenda 2030 and the principles and a lot of what's embodied in there, the interconnections, the integrated responses, are a fantastic blueprint for us to think about uh, mm -hmm. building back better. Thank you. So um, I'd like to now turn to Manjuri um, and, and, and hear from her about um, some of the comments that have been made, particularly about these responses, 
um, drawing particularly on what, what you know about lessons of history, you know, and how um, what Mandeep said about the need for this sort of integrated uh, solution um, that is people-centered and not necessarily only depending on these sort of techno technocratic and technological fixes um, um, is, is what's needed not only to um, beat the virus, so to speak, but, um, but also to make sure that the, that the burden and the costs are not borne disproportionately by the poor and the vulnerable, both people, communities, and countries. Yeah. No, thank you very much, Sakiko. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel, despite the depressing topic. Um, you know, as exceptional and as um, massive as the COVID epidemic is proving to be, we have in older epidemics really seen versions of this, whether this be <clears throat> in a much more localized way in Ebola, in the AIDS pandemic, um, and cholera and tuberculosis, which are chronic epidemics in large parts of the world, which have a massive death toll, which still far exceeds what we are seeing with COVID. And it maybe behooves us to learn some things from those experiences. And I think some of those themes have already been echoed by several of the speakers, but um, let me just underline some of them, which is about you know, the emergency discourse around any epidemic in the moment makes it seem as though the response has to be about measures taken immediately in the short term. Whereas what really determines outcomes is the investments in resilient egalitarian health systems over a long term. And somewhere we have to, even as we talk about pandemic preparedness and containment measures, not lose sight of this longer term investment that we need to be making in health systems. So that's kind of the first point that really runs across whether we're talking about New York City or Italy or India or Uganda. Um, the second thing, which I think is a theme that runs across what people are saying is that we have to stop thinking about health and the response to the COVID epidemic as a standalone sector. Uh, where the response has to be determined by health specialists and health experts and health systems and hospitals alone. Um, the health has to really be embedded firmly within larger social, economic, political governance systems. Um, and, and, you know, this is something that we have time and again failed to do so, and this kind of cross-sectoral response really determines the longer term success of various countries, but also we as an entire global community to respond to pandemics periodically. Um, I mean, just to give you an example from India where, um, you know, the, the con even as important as containment is, the lockdown measures have really become a kind of globalized template. So in India, a very strict lockdown was announced with four hours of warning, um, not taking into account seriously the tens of millions of daily wage laborers who need to earn money that day on a daily basis to buy food, um, making hunger a big issue, not taking into account things that um, people live in extremely congested cramped quarters without access to clean water and clean sanitation systems. Um, not taking into account how rural populations have to harvest crops, which need to be harvested today, um, and need to invest in planting, which will ensure their livelihoods tomorrow. Um, and treating the lockdown and treating social distancing increasingly as globalized templates without keeping in mind the different ways this will actually play out in different societies, I think has been a real problem. Um, and so it just underlines the need to embed health in conversation with other sectors and other expertise. And so that's the next point that I want to make that the experts who are considered relevant and who need to be at the table and addressing the epidemic cannot just be public health epidemiological 
and biomedical experts. This really has to be a response which should bring voices and people and expertise to the table that include people who have a keen knowledge of how rural livelihoods work, how um, um, you know, the sociology of slums work, how gender um, plays out and how, you know, why domestic violence has spiked in many countries around the world. Um, and those experts and those voices need to be party to decision making around in, in dealing with this temp and dealing with this epidemic. So, so, you know, not treating health as a standalone sector having cross-sectoral analysis, having a range of expertise in dealing with this, and paying heed to lessons from history, which show that it's not just about what we do tomorrow, but investments that we'll make for several decades to come and legacies that we are seeing playing out from the last several decades where individual countries have made sometimes bad decisions, but lots of individual countries haven't been sovereign decision makers. They've had their hands tied and they've been forced to make some decisions. Well, yes, I, I mean, I, I think it's very, very um, uh, interesting, but also rather, di di rather discouraging that, in fact, a lot of what you're saying, um, you know, treating health problems, not just through the health sector, but through other multiple sectors, um, long term investment in health systems that are equitable um, that, and universal um, and um, not relying entirely on health uh, technology expertise. I mean, these are things that have been pointed out and argued um, for decades. And there is even a whole field of public health, which is all about that. and. Um, understanding of health, not as only a biomedical problem, but a uh, tracing the social determinants of health. Uh, th these, are, these are all um, lessons that we have learned over the years and that have been pointed out and raised. Um, so, so these are not new, new lessons, you know. Um, but I mean, I, I think we have to, think in this moment, you know, how do we also um, um, take lessons from some of the things that have worked in the past <laughs> to, to promote uh, some of these solutions that you have been, say, uh, been, been arguing for uh, in this particular, particular moment. Um, I want to just take a moment to speak to the audience. Um, one of the frustrating things about a webinar as opposed to a real meeting is that I cannot see the, the audience. I see that I understand that there are hundreds of people uh, listening in uh, on this conversation. Um, and we will have time for uh, questions from the audience. So please start putting in your, your questions now if you have them. Um, and um, we will make time to um, address them. Um, so um, moving forward, I'd, I'd like to um, pick up on some of the things that have been said um, just now. I think um, this question of um, this not being just a health problem, but a, a multi sort of uh, social, multi sectoral uh, requiring multi sectoral response, maybe responses that that intersect. Um, can um, who, can uh, can you say something about you know, who would like to say something about um, what those responses might be? So Nicoletta, perhaps um, you'd like to say something about what the civil society uh, is, um, is, is advocating at this moment. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say before I started that I entirely, entirely agree with what Manjari said. I think uh, this is uh, honestly the paradigm shift, the, the, the paradigm change that I think we need, uh, the new design for, for really uh, looking at 
basically hu human rights or, or you know basic people's rights a people-centered uh, approach to 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 life on this planet because as as uh, previous speakers have said um covid-19 is a symptom of many pathologies that were already there uh, in fact in itself the virus is a pretty innocent pathogen it's just you know a wake up call to a, a world that is uh, rather arrogantly not taking the opportunity of previous wake up calls that have come uh, over the last 20 years uh, just uh, to to you know to stay to 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 circumscribe our analysis to the so i i entirely believe that uh, uh, what COVID-19 tells us is that, uh, yes, it's a question of health, but it's a question of, uh, a, of, a, of a totally unregulated globalization and uh, of, a, of a system where space for uh, living beings is being reduced and uh, the environment is being devastated and uh, there are consequences for this on the negative side. On the positive side, uh, of course, uh, uh, we need a change, but I think that the change will not happen by itself in a way, you know? I think the, uh, our eyes will not kind of uh, suddenly open to the non-sustainability of the pre-virus world. And uh, we are not necessarily bound to a rebalancing of the system we, if we don't uh, have a, a clear vision and also a, a clear leadership that uh, leads us in that direction. I think that uh, um, definitely we have zero chance for a change if we stay in silos, if we keep uh, you know, areas of rights separated. Uh, and therefore, health is not a standalone issue. Health goes with a human, I mean, health already in itself, uh, as it's hu human health, it's animal health, it goes with agriculture, it goes with the way that we exploit the land to extract uh, food uh, in an industrial fashion out of the land, or we respect the land in order to guarantee biodiversity and food for, for people in a, in a functional way. It, it depends very much on how we produce energy and the model, the energetic model we set in place. So um, there are all these instances that uh, definitely go hand in hand and finance. Do we, I mean, Winnie was, was referring to finance and I totally share the, 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 you know, the, the analysis that she's made, I mean, it's not even an analysis, this is such a, such a visible reality that uh, the system of debt for low and middle income countries does not function. It's, everybody knows it does not work. Even the World Bank came out recently, uh, I think it was January, with a report saying, the World Bank saying that we, we have a debt crisis because I mean, let's face it, indebted countries, so-called indebted countries, have already abundantly repaid their debt, abundantly. And therefore, the G20 measure of, you know, just freezing the debt for six months or eight months, whatever, is, is, is basically a sign that, uh, you know, the international community has not yet understood what the implications of this virus are and how, to what extent this virus is actually telling us so many more things about the next viruses or the next crisis that will come with climate change. So this is really a kind of a gym for the world. It's a kind of a testing ground for the world. And at the moment, as civil society organizations, and of course, Winnie, having led Oxfam, she knows very well, we, we are working on some of the knots, the structural knots that are actually tangling the world. One is debt, for sure, and it is also the fact that uh, financial flows can move freely without uh, any, you know, without any regulation. They can go where the best opportunities are in the name of uh, financial cynicism, I would say. So they bet on countries' devastation, they, they move from one place to the other without any control. And, uh, unless and until we regulate capital flows, 
we will not actually promise, we will not be able to promise and, and envisage any sustainable solutions in the long run uh, to build those resilient systems uh, to protect health, to protect education, to protect uh, uh, all the various human rights. The other question is that we, you mentioned the previous speakers, uh, my colleagues uh, spoke correctly about access. Now, um, a couple of days ago, the World Health Organization uh, held a, a kind of a pre-launch of uh, the big pledge that will take place on the 4th of May in order to um, you know, embark uh, all uh, governments and the private sector into securing global access to medical products, uh, vaccines, but also the medical equipment like masks and all the things that are needed and will be needed for uh, uh, tackling the, 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 the health issue. Now, I was really, uh, I was really struck because, you know, I, I strongly believe on, I strongly believe on, believe on multilateralism and the multilateral organizations and I'm seriously worried for the brutal attack that the US administration has uh, engaged against the World Health Organization, which is a highly imperfect organization, uh, but it is like all the other UN agencies, the only harbor of ethical values that we still have. And I think that our effort in this situation, in this moment, under the current uh, uh, unprecedented circumstances should not be directed to dismantling the global governance, the public global international governance we have, rather to strengthen it. Therefore, it is not really what we want to have, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation being the first supporter, the first contributor to the World Health Organization and having the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation being the one that actually hosts the meeting of the WHO. This is something that is profoundly dysfunctional. And we, in, in the whole meeting of the WHO, you had the governments, of course, you had the private sector. There was no one from the civil society organization, social movements, and those variety, diversity of expertise that actually Manjari was advocating for. So let's be careful that this is not a moment used to shrink further the the, the, the kind of responsibility chain, <laughs> the, the trackability of where responsibilities are, and actually the mechanism of democracy at all levels, at the national, at the local level, at the national level, and also at the international level. Uh, when we talk about access, it's clear, it's absolutely clear that governments cannot rely upon the willingness and voluntary attitudes of big pharmaceutical companies to release their bullets because whenever, I mean, whoever finds the vaccine or the drug against COVID-19 has a huge, you know, uh, negotiating power. And uh, because companies now, pharma sector is now more and more uh, establishing the price of their drugs based on the, the, the therapeutic value, that they attribute to the, to the therapy or to the vaccine, it's clear that there is a war that is being prepared. There is a war coming about access. Unless and until governments include access to the products into their preparedness package and start to really um, reconsider the fact that we cannot secure any science, any research and development, any access to medicines or vaccines or whatever we need to combat viruses, if we maintain a system that is featured by monopoly rights, this is totally out of this world. It needs to change. It has to change. And we really need to bring science research back into the public domain, establish a new model for pharmaceutical production, and actually have a responsibility that stays with governments, which is not to, to exclude the pharma sector. I mean, let's, uh, you know, I'm not, but we really, have to, uh, we really have to establish new ground rules. The ball cannot be led by the pharma companies. It has to stay with governments. 
So I think that access and I mean, health cannot depend on trade, basically, okay? This is, this is something that we've learned in the last 25 years. Health cannot be ancillary to trade, a multilateral system, and the use of finance. I think this is fundamental. And these are the areas on which civil society organizations are more focused at the moment. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions and it's difficult to choose because there's so many of them. Um, I, um, but I want to sort of follow up on this, this question of, of access, um, which will be in fact um, the topic of the next monthly webinar, which will be at the end of um, next month in May. So please uh, hang on uh, for more discussion on, on that topic. Um, um, following up on um, some of what was said um, about these um, the, the multilateral responses that is, is, is fundamental to both um, uh, debt um, as well as to um, to which is fundamental again to the financing of the social safety nets, the social systems, the health systems in in all countries of the world. Um, here is one question that I think is uh, quite interesting, which is relevant here um, from uh, Eric in Pennsylvania, um, who is saying, I'm wondering how this crisis has affected nations sovereignty over health policy decisions in a new way. I think Manjuri, uh, you alluded to this uh, in your earlier comments. Um, could I also ask the, 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 the speakers uh, at this point to really limit your answers to answers um, and to be quite focused in your, uh, in your responses and limit them to one or two minutes so that we can get um, more people um, engaged? Manjuri, do you have a question? Do you have an answer to this, or maybe, maybe Winnie, would you like to answer that question about the sovereignty of countries? Uh, can you unmute yourself? Ah, oh. you're muted again. Can you unmute yourself now? Oh, okay. Thank you. The question was, what is new? What is new with the COVID? And the Winnie, the, the, question, the question I am asking is from the one, there, there are dozens of questions being um, uh, mm. put down here. And I'm, asked, I'm picking one from Eric from Pennsylvania, who is saying, I'm wondering how this crisis has affected nation's sovereignty over health policy decisions in a new way. Well, one is, and I, let me quote the Secretary General of the United Nations recently said that this a pandemic has proven to us more than ever before that our, the strength of our health system is only as strong as the weakest national health system. Our interdependence has come out so clearly. It is futile to fight to, to win against corona in your country, knowing very well the virus does not respect borders and will be in your country again if the fight is not won in other countries. So the issue of our interconnectedness is on the table. It's not about the sovereignty of countries to manage their own health policy, but it's about fighting together. It's about finding solutions together, applying, learning quickly from each other, sharing resources. It's about a, a global response that's connected to national responses, but it does not take away national sovereignty, but it emphasizes our interdependence and the importance of a coordinated response from the, from the community to the national, to the to the global level. Without that, we will just go round in circles with this pandemic shooting every now and again from different corners of this planet. There's another thing about our, about the national sovereignty. There's also the issue of access to diagnostic tools, therapeutic tools, vaccines, medicines. It's so important that 
kits, testing kits are available everywhere. Not to have some poor countries at the back of the queue waiting for the rich ones to stock up for themselves first. A vaccine must hit the market with a prior arrangement that this is a global public good and there's a prior arrangement where we will all have equal access. Otherwise, even those who will get it first are not safe. They are not safe because we are moving in a global economy and people are moving from this place to that place. So coordination is key. It doesn't give up sovereignty, but it just means that we work with agreements and we share resources and we share technology. Can I quickly add something, Sakika? Yeah, so I think what we are seeing today in the international market for diagnostic kits, but even far more basic protective equipment like masks and gloves, is that it's become a really ruthless competitive sphere where the United States, European countries have completely cornered the, the market for buying things like gloves and masks, forget, forget um, you know, more sophisticated technologies. Um, so there was this very evocative case of a company, an American company in Cambodia, which produces millions of um, masks and gloves. And when the Cambodian government asked it for a shipment of a few thousand, it said it could not because the United States government wanted it all to come only to the United States. And I think fundamentally this is linked to what Nicoletta and others have been saying that we should use this pandemic as an opportunity to increasingly de-link the logics of health from the logics of the marketplace, whether this be in the national realm or whether this be in certain international realms where the status of health has to be understood as being special where it cannot be completely vulnerable to the ebbs and flows of national competition, of intellectual property monopolies, um, of prices and demands, where the status of what we are talking about here is human life really should be held at a higher normative level. And some of this was achieved during the AIDS epidemic and the access to medicines campaign, both within countries like South Africa, which use their liberal constitution and the courts to very successfully make the government more responsive. But it was also very successfully done by a coalition of social actors in the international domain. And I think we really have to think creatively about how this pandemic can be used to change the narratives around health, um, but more broadly around social safety nets, social welfare, keeping the most vulnerable in mind. And, and you know, um, I'm gonna leave it at that though. I could go on about how these narratives can be changed and should be changed. Uh, it was, that's beautifully said. I, 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 I think that um, the idea of uh, delinking the logics of health from the logic of the market um, is, um, uh, I, I think is sort of foundational to, to our thinking because health is not a commodity. I think it's, it's a, that the problem is a commodification of health. Um, health is not the same uh, issue as the choice of the color of a, a dress that you might buy or the uh, a choice that you might make in ordering for food in a restaurant if you're uh, into ordering food in restaurants. So, um, I think, um, let me move to um, some other interesting topics here. Um, there are questions about multilateralism. Um, um, I think what you're all saying is that sovereignty, well, you know, how do we think about sovereignty in this space where we're talking about a public good, where um, you, you cannot have sovereignty that is autarky or you cannot, is meaningless unless there is international cooperation until there is multilateral cooperation. Um, but given that um, um, we need, may perhaps need this kind of multilateral cooperation, there is a, a, a question from Zina from in Maastricht, Netherlands, saying regarding the new design of a new approach in leadership, is the UN's role becoming obsolete? Who should be held ac accountable globally for shortcomings during the crisis? Uh, can I come in on this, yes. 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 
thank you so much. I mean, this is, uh, it's a very interesting question and I'm sure many people um, have this question on their minds, but I think precisely for what Winnie explained as this incredibly interconnected challenge that's presented by inequality, COVID-19, and I will add climate to it as well, I think we need a much stronger multilateral system, um, a, a well-funded, uh, well-represented multilateral system that really advances global public goods um, and doesn't prioritize um, rich nations over developing nations. Um, so I think it's precisely the nature of COVID um, and its, you know, its global distribution, the interconnections that it's highlighted, um, and, and how quickly health around the world can unravel with one virus, one little virus, um, that we that the response to it actually is a response that requires multi-stakeholder, multilateral systems to work together. Now I want to say something about sovereignty and governments, you know. Oh, often when people think about member states or or, or uh, the multilateral system, they think it's just governments. It is not just the governments. It is the people that the governments serve. So I think we need to think about the system as a whole and put people back into the core of the multilateral system. That's what the multilateral system, the UN was established for, right? It was to, uh, it was to make sure that we did not end up in a situation um, where the most vulnerable people were suffering due to war at that time. So the system was created to advance human dignity, to protect human rights and promote human rights. And that is a matter of global concern. It's a global public good. It's not a matter of one country's sovereignty. And that requires a joined up effort across government, across civil society, across the private sector. And one of the trends that we see that which is quite concerning is the private sector capture of government functions, of public functions, of public responsibilities. You see it in the digital space, you see it in the health space. Um, and I think this is where we really need to have the multilateral system leading from the front on maintaining and securing global public goods like human health, animal health, and environmental health. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm only going to have time for one more question, maybe two, uh, if people are quick. But um, I, do, I, I do think that these points about um, a new kind of multilateralism um, is, um, is, is, is really, uh, really important. I mean, you mentioned the importance of civil society. Uh, and true, most people don't realize that the uh, United Nations, for example, as an institution, is supposed to have this, you know, civil society voice in it. But then the structures that have been designed in the 20th century are very state-centric. And, and so I, for one, do believe that we need to have new formats. So I see Winnie uh, gesturing her <laughs> agreement with this. Uh, this, this so if I can come in and build on what Mandeep has said, we Just want multilateralism that is people centered. Yes. And right. not state centered. Yeah. What we are seeing on the ground today with these responses isn't learning from what we have learned about fighting epidemics or a new multilateralism, because we're seeing countries forming responses that are health led and some even security led. They are declaring war on an invisible virus. And, and using all the language of war and focusing on the health aspects and not building integrated approaches that involve communities at the center. We are not seeing communities at the center. We are not learning the lessons from HIV or building the new multilateralism. That's my concern. So the last question I want to uh, turn to is from Luisa Nafif Perez from New York. Um, and she says, actually, uh, I want to draw your attention to an excellent 
a research paper that she has published recently with co-authors at the Levy Institute uh, at Bard College on inequality and COVID-19 in the United States. Um, and she's, she's asking on a different quest point uh, on the sovereignty note. And in fact, we have seen powerful countries retreating from globalization and being more nationalist. Isn't there a global responsibility for them? Um, so uh, <laughs> this is a rhetorical question, perhaps. Um, uh, I imagine that almost all of us would agree with this, um, but um, uh, maybe what I could do is to ask each of you uh, to make a one minute statement uh, inspired by this, um, by this question, and then we will have to close the, uh, the conversation. Um, so um, uh, let me uh, maybe start with, um, uh, with James as, um, would you like to make your one point, one minute statement to close, um, sure. uh, responding yeah. perhaps to this, this question, given that uh, you're not an internationalist, you're working on the city, but how is the city affected by the yeah, global? No, so um, here in the United States, we've been, uh, we've been, uh, you know, tremendously affected by the incapable leadership that we've had at the national level, which was what the, a couple of the questions are getting at in terms of the United States, uh, you know, doing nothing to foster uh, better coordination internationally. And we see, you know, inward facing in the United States, we certainly see the same thing, sort of a lack of effective leadership uh, in uh, coordinating the healthcare system and trying to figure out the right sort of economic responses and so on. It just, um, I mean, on the, on the question about whether or not the, the UN is less relevant, I think what, what our president has done uh, inadvertently has made the UN a lot more relevant because the United States in a, in a normal period might be providing international leadership uh, on this or any crisis is just totally not doing that, doing the opposite, in fact. So there are lots of ways, and, and just in terms of what, what I see next in the United States, it, it's been very clear that the healthcare system is so inadequate in the United States, despite all of the resources that we heap upon it, it was uh, you know, completely incapable of developing an effective test, <laughs> something that every other country was able to do, we were not able to do that. So, it's a, so hopefully out of this, we will have a spirited national conversation about what sort of healthcare system we, we need that addresses uh, sort of the basic uh, need for uh, coordination and effectiveness, as well as uh, a thoroughgoing response to the the raft of inequities that we've seen exposed in this. Thank you. Now, uh, can I tr uh, turn to Manjuri to go next? Thank you, Sakika. Um, so I, I, I want to go back to this point about using this as an opportunity to change some of the narratives around health. Um, but in, in a linked way around questions of sovereignty and how one responds to crisis to um, there is perhaps an inevitable logic in an emergency to pay emphasis to underline the importance of strong leadership, which can make decisive decisions, right? Which can make decisive, take decisive actions, um, be clear. And I think those are all important aspects of how to respond in an emergency. But there is a real danger that in this emphasis on strong, quick action, um, that we lose sight of the fact that in responding to public health crisis, what is absolutely central is that the population has to trust the leadership. Um, and that is ensured only if there is a certain level of transparency, if there is a certain level of freedom in expression, if there is an allowance for debate and dissent. Um, and somewhere we, in our emphasis 
of you know kind of an emergency narrative of quick response immediate response direct response we should not forget these lessons of the importance of trust and transparency um, and ensure that both at an international level but also at a national level we really demand that of our leadership and how they do public decision making I have a countdown here, so <laughs> Nicoletta. I, I, you, you have okay. to. Yes. Okay, it's a. Um, I have uh, mentioned in my writing on on this uh, story uh, the the question about health sovereignism. Eh? And I think this has been extremely functional to the contagion. Health sovereignism has been really every country uh, thinking that they could compete with other countries, even within Europe, in order to secure their emergency package. In fact, uh, countries have looked at China with distance, also prejudice or judgment, not thinking that, I mean, imagining that the virus would not move beyond the borders of China and come elsewhere. So these are all um, factors that have largely contributed to the contagion. And I think we definitely uh, have, a, you know, the, the clear evidence it doesn't work. So now more than ever, we have a very uh, clear, you know, and eloquent lesson that only through solidarity, international cooperation, can we face these huge challenges? As I said before, COVID-19 is just the first one. Others will come because if we look at the climate change thing, we will see that others, uh, it's a really a testing ground. So we need that collaboration. We need a better uh, and, and more modern, updated multilateral system. Honestly, I don't think we need a multi-stakeholderism unless we have ground rules. Today, we have a multi-stakeholderism which is based on new, no rules. So we are all stakeholders and, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, there is no drawing of the line whether I'm pursuing my profit or I'm pursuing the public interest. This is something that will be, that will have to be tackled. And so we can improve, but we need institutions. Uh, sorry, sorry to have to cut you off no, there. No, 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 no. So we are really uh, tight on time. We have one minute each for, uh, um, Mandeep and Winnie. Winnie, would you like to go first? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, please. Okay. I, uh, thanks, Akiko. We will win this battle on the ground. We must empower communities, make them center in shaping and leading responses. It's all local. Two, we must be data-driven, evidence-based. We cannot win when we are not focusing on what works. And three, we've talked about global collaboration. I add global coordination, strong coordination and sharing of resources. And lastly, tackling the structural inequalities that existed before in order to build a better world afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mandeep. Thank you, thank you, and it's, um, I agree with so much of what, uh, what my fellow panelists have said. But I think one of the things that's the big challenge and also part of the solution for me when I think about this to, is to tackle these multiple crises of inequality, climate, and COVID-19. We need to be able to work across systems and across sectors and across contexts that are in some ways complex and uncertain and new, and we absolutely do need a rule book for that. I think that's absolutely critical. But I go back to uh, what, where a lot of my experience has been, and that has been in responding to HIV um, over a number of decades now. Um, and the primacy of science and data and policy and decision-making that is driven by science and data in a way that empowers communities, as Winnie has said, is critical. And solidarity, I mean, I think we've learned over and over again the importance of global solidarity and really re, um, recapturing and re-energizing uh, re this notion that health is a global public good. And, and that is the job of uh, the multilateral system, that is the job of governments, that is the job of communities, 
Um, and other stakeholders have an important role to play, but really it is the, you know, we need to capture, recapture the importance of health as a global public good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I don't really have time to wrap up, but let me just say that I think this conversation has highlighted how we need to understand um, ways forward, drawing on many of the experiences we have. And I, I do think that the last references that um, uh, were made about the parallels with the HIV AIDS um, crisis moments are also very instructive because there have been terrible, terrible losses through that, but also in terms of civil society mobilizing the solidarity, um, the, the very smart uh, moves, the science, the data, the economic analysis, the, uh, the policy, the, 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 the evidence-based um, analytical work that um, was behind advocacy for policy change with respect to access to medicines with re and you know related to things like uh, like debt relief I, I think that was really uh, we do have a lot of positive lessons to draw from many of those that that progress that was made and, and some of the structural um, uh, issues that were addressed at the time um, in advancing particularly human rights uh, for, for health. So I want to end by uh, thanking all of the speakers, uh, Mandeep uh, Daliwal, uh, Nicoletta Dentico, Manjari Mahajan, James Parrott, um, Winnie Bianima, um, and also all of those who have helped in organizing. Uh, I want to, um, uh, also, of course, thank the, the audience for being there. And I'm awfully sorry that um, I was not able to get to the dozens of questions that were, were raised, many of which are really interesting, but we could have been here for the entire day uh, discussing many of the issues that were, that were raised. Um, finally, before closing, um, I'd like to, um, of course, thank um, Global um, sorry, Health Policy Watch, uh, our co-sponsors. And I want to also announce that moving forward, uh, we will also be uh, partnering with the Independent Panel for um, uh, uh, Global Governance for Health um, that is based at the um, University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment, uh, otherwise known as SUM. Um, and um, the next, uh, we have a lineup of exciting new webinars. Uh, May 27th will be on um, equitable access to <clears throat> diagnostics, uh, treatments, uh, vaccines, technologies. Um, in June, on June 24th, we will have a, a webinar on digital technologies um, and health inequities. And then in July, um, on July 22nd, we will have a webinar on environment and um, COVID-19 uh, inequalities. So um, please um, stay connected and keep watching our uh, website on uh, New School events. And um, um, also, if you are interested in other uh, activities that we are conducting at the New School in the International Affairs Program, uh, please go to our um, website. We have courses, we have other kinds of blogs and things like that. And I'm sure all of our speakers and our partners have uh, similar um, um, platforms for uh, uh, debating COVID-19 and inequality. So thank you very much. Goodbye.